Hi, welcome. My name is Dr. Corey Wren. I am a sociologist with the University of Kent, and this is my lecture on ecofeminism in a nutshell with a uh, bias towards human non-human relationships because my speciali speciality is vegan feminism. So we will be exploring that in the latter half of this lecture. So we're going to be looking at ecofeminism in general, some of the arguments, some of the counter arguments, its histories, its origin. I'm going to be then moving into the non-human animal aspect where I'm going to be talking about how sex and gender constructions from human cultures is imposed on other animals and impacts their life chances. And it's also a reciprocal relationship. So our relationships with other animals also shapes our own gender roles. Um, and then it's also very relevant from a sociological perspective because patriarchy and speciesism, two systems of domination and oppression, emerged at the same time. So it's really important to understand not just patriarchy, which we get a lot in sociology, but also speciesism because the two very much so emerged together. <clears throat> so ecofeminism really emerged in the 1960s, 70s, 80s or so, uh, even into the 1990s, it was still gaining momentum. Um, basically as a response to the male centrism or androcentrism of the environmental movement, also in the, the discipline of philosophy, which informs a lot of environmental uh, thought and activism and even policy. It was also a spinoff from the emerging feminist movements and the environmental movements. So it was not just a response to male centrism, but it was also a response to all of this left organizing that was happening. And so it was an emerging of these two interests. So ecofeminism is unique in that it re recognizes, explicitly recognizes marginalized groups and the stakes that they have and seeks to give them a voice at the table uh, when traditionally uh, a lot of environmental work has been very oriented towards the middle classes, the people living in the West or um, uh, men in many cases. So ecofeminism is saying that actually we need to pay paying attention to the most marginalized groups in our society because they are the ones that have the highest um, stakes in this um, tailspin that we have going on with environmental destruction. They also come at it, this is the philosophy uh, element to it, so they also come into it and say, well actually our relationship with nature and other animals is not just that we're especially burdening marginalized groups, but really we have very gendered relationships with nature and other animals to begin with. So what happens then is you have uh, since, for instance, Mother Earth and this, these terms like raping the, raping the earth uh, and historically a lot of that was done by men and for male capitalist interests. So it's a very much so, the, even the language that we use, the way we conceptualize our relationship with nature and other animals, it tends to be very, very gendered, not just philosophically, but actually in practice because it tends to be men who uh, or, or patriarchal entities that are responsible for a lot of this destruction and exploitation. So ecofeminism, as feminism in general, even takes that so it takes that back a little bit further and says, well, we should be critical of the gendering process itself. Now, not all feminists agree with this, but many of them do take issue with the fact that we create these constructs, these divisions, these categories, and it is this very uh, work of creating hierarchies and categories that allows for domination. When you create divisions, you allow for that inequality. So gender is very, very fundamental uh, in our culture, in many cultures, for naturalizing difference and hierarchy. Some other elements to ecofeminism, it tends to be very informed by spiritualism, a feeling of follow your intuition and emotions. Again, this is a response to the androcentrism of the environmental movement, but specifically the philosophy, the philosophy discipline where a lot of this, uh, this, this environmental thought originated from. Um, in case you're not aware, the ph philosophical discipline has been very male dominated. Even to this day, it's one of the most, if not the most, uh, at least in the humanities, the most male-centric discipline. So even today, it continues to have problems with incorporating women's voices. So out of environmental ethics, women said, okay, we are going to push back on this androcentric trend towards rationalism, and instead, let's follow our emotions and, our, and take a spiritual approach. Because the whole point is that that white, male, Western, uh, rational, objective kind of perspective is taken to be 
neutral or bias free when it is in fact its own perspective. So feminists, eco-feminists say, okay, well, we are coming at this from another perspective, recognizing that n neither one of us can be, neither groups can be free from bias. Uh, something else that they really emphasize is an ethic of care. So and this is a response to the more patriarchal tradition of we need to create rights and build fences around each other so that no one can come into my fence and I am protected here. We need laws and everything uh, and armed forces if need be in order to protect ourselves. And it's very you know conflict oriented in a way. But the ethic of care comes out of the feminist tradition and says instead of you know having to build more walls and be more oh, so conflicted, what if instead we just went by caring for one another? So it's again pulling on this essentialist notion of what women are supposed to be, you know, very caring and very nurturing. So also coming from the feminist tradition is a focus on the community. So how can we deal with social problems at the community level? And again, this is breaking down that traditional rationalistic hierarchy approach. There's also a distinct activist component, and again, this comes straight from the feminist movement, where it's not just about, we can't just sit in armchairs and philosophize, we need to be thinking about how we can incorporate our actual behavior, so it's very pragmatic in that way. So, I, you may have hint, heard a hint from the tone of my voice, I do think that there are a few issues with ecofeminism that warrant us to consider. Uh, first off, if we rely just on an ethic of care, then those groups who lack rights are going to be left out and, and vulnerable. So it tends to be those marginalized groups who are the ones who are lacking the rights, such as women, people of color, people in uh, the global south, non-human animals. So for those who lack rights, it can actually be a little bit patronizing or patriarchal in, in, in a way where we're saying, well, you don't need rights, don't worry, we'll just take care of you, we'll apply our ethic of care. Uh, but for me personally, I would prefer to have some rights and I would like to be protected. And, and for non-human animals, for instance, who have don't even have the basic right to life, I think that rights would be very important in that case. So there's also a problem with the potential to reify gender essentialism. So by assuming that men are the very rational um, hierarchically thinking, oppressive, conflict-oriented folks, and then women are naturally nurturing and caring and community-based, and therefore we should take the feminine approach. In doing that, it's actually nurturing that divide. It's actually assuming that women are all caring and nurturing when, you know, maybe some aren't. That's a cultural uh, construction. So there are some issues then with ecofeminism and nurturing a divide, even though it's supposed to be breaking down divides. Historically, the ecofeminist movement is just like the feminist movement in that it has had difficulty with its white centrism. Uh, a lot of this has to do with class and access to education, who gets platform, who gets voice. Uh, so it tends to be a lot of older white women who dominate the ecofeminist movement. There are lots of there are lots of women of color who are involved, but there tends to be a an orientation towards uh, white western interests so that's an important criticism uh, that needs to be explored i also think that the spiritualistic emphasis again that's on that it's ba uh, dredging up that that gender essentialism and assuming that women are very spiritual and like one with nature and things like that um, but then there are many women like myself i consider myself an eco-feminist but i'm atheist and i was raised atheist and i that the spiritualistic stuff does not speak to me at all and so in many ways i feel excluded from the movement because of this hyper focus on um, mother nature and gaia and all that sort of thing so there are some issues then with maintaining hierarchies so for instance in the united states and also in the uk it's very religious oriented you know, culture, and so I think that the ecofeminist thing is kind of pulling on that privilege of being uh, having religion. There's also a division, speaking of hierarchies, about the importance of non-human animals. So the ecofeminist movement has not traditionally included non-human animals. It has included nature, and it's included the environment, and it's recognized this link between the treatment of women and the treatment of nature. But many ecofeminists, especially when the movement was taking off, really did not have much to say about non-human animals. And in fact, when the vegan feminists came along and started pushing back really in the 1980s and onward, there was quite a bit of resistance from the uh, non-vegan eco-feminists who believed that, well, you're, you're being sexist and, saying, sexist and saying that women should be vegan, 
um, because you know women are globally more poor and they need to eat meat and all these sorts of things. But ultimately, what is happening is that it's a it's first off it's a white centrism again because and poor women across the world have traditionally eaten vegan food or close to vegan food, but also it completely objectifies non-human animals and fails to recognize that non-human animals are also persons. They are also are sentient. They also have interests in seeking pleasure, avoiding pain, having a life, living their life, and just like a human being would. So traditionally, eco-feminists did not actually recognize non-human animals. So what I'm getting at here is that although eco-feminism, the, the whole point is to knock down these patriarchal hierarchies, of worth, who is worthy, who is not worthy, who's more, who's less. Actually, because of the anthropocentrism of ecofeminism, the tradition of that, it's spiritualism, uh, it's white centrism, it still itself has some work to do about breaking down those hierarchies of worth. So now let's move into vegan feminism. So vegan feminism is basically making the argument that it's not just women in nature that are entwined, but we actually see gender and animality, or species, however you want to call it, they are very much so entwined. So I'm going to show, move forward this and show you some evidence to support this claim, but basically what happens in the study of animals in society, and I should have mentioned this is my main area of research, I'm currently the chair of the American Sociological Association's uh, Animals in Society, section. So what we argue in this in this discipline is that this category that has been created of animality to be an animal, that is an artificial construction. But once we create that box of animality, it's the what does it mean to be an animal but the most inferior, stupid, ignorant, irrational, close to the earth, bodied, not you know, not mind-centered. So basically the lowest of the low, on the bottom of a hierarchy of worth. So as long as we have this category, we can put any kind of minority human group into that category and non-human animals into that category. And therefore, culturally, symbolically, it allows a rationale for the exploitation and oppression of these groups. So for people of color, for women, for people uh, from colonized people, people from the global south, disabled people, older people, you name it, any type of minority human group and non-human animals have been dumped into that animal category in order to rationalize, justify a system of exploitation. Now, specifically in vegan feminism, we do talk about all of that because it's a very intersectional uh, sort of approach or discipline, but we do very much so focus on gender because, as I mentioned uh, at the beginning of this lecture, historically patriarchy and speciesism, or anthroparchy, if you'd like to call it that, they emerged together. So this really was the, the formation, this construction of the other when we started to exploit non-human animals and the gender division emerged subsequent, subsequently. So the argument here is that we need to challenge privilege or entitled consumption. So when we're talking about environmental sociology, consumption is a major part of it. It's consumption is this overconsumption or entitled consumption is what has led to this dramatic uh, crisis that we are in right now. By the way, animal agriculture is the leading cause of greenhouse gases. It's the number one you know, problem with contributing to uh, global warming. So consumption is fundamental to environmental sociology, but consumption is also very fundamental to the exploitation of minority groups. It creates a hierarchy of worth and it supports violence against women, animals, and the environment. So this is very important then to understand this category of animality, which emerged many thousands of years ago, which I'll talk about later in the lecture, and how this consumption is very much so part of the, the, the logic to this machine. <clears throat> So veganism then is very fundamental here simply because veganism challenges the most fundamental and dramatic form of social consumption. That's the eating of other animals. So I just mentioned that animal agriculture is a leading uh, cause of, uh, of our climate change right now. But really, out of all those minority groups that I've mentioned, it is non-human animals that experience the most dramatic form of consumption by more privileged groups, by oppressor, oppressing classes. I mean, they are literally killed and literally put into people's bodies, literally slathered on their bodies, literally worn on their bodies. You can't get any more fundamental than this type of consumption. So that's where vegan feminism comes in, recognizing that animality is the fundamental category that allows for all sorts of exploitation, but also paying attention to consumption, specifically consumption, and so veganism, of course, is about what you consume and don't consume. 
And if, by the way, if you don't know what veganism is, I think we're pretty aware by now, but just in case, veganism is a person who, for political reasons, does not consume any animal products whatsoever as far as, as possible.